on the phone. It is always a pleasure to welcome to the program contributor to the nation, author of Herding Donkeys. Of course, I am referring to Ari Berman. Ari, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me back, Sam. Uh, always a pleasure, Ari. I want you to know, let's start this off uh, with the important stuff. There are people on Twitter who are just outraged. Uh, they want to see the receipts. They want to see the canceled check. They want to see uh, the the cash um, that uh, you owe me for all the bets that we've made in the past. And I'm just uh, Sam. I think I think you have the distinction of being the only person I know who won't actually cash in on their winning bet uh, because I've offered you on numerous occasions uh, dinner at Nobu. Real, seriously? Based on our 2008 bet, and you have turned it down. No, no, then I haven't you, turned it down. You, <laughs> I'll take it then, right now. Then you went double or nothing, which I, which I I believe that you somehow, in spite of all logic, were able to win. Then I credited you on Twitter while also demanding a recount, but I did credit you. Yeah. And and there was a conspicuous silence uh, from your Twitter account, which which really I'm upset in, me. I'm in heavy negotiations to see if I'm allowed to go out and have a, a dinner at uh, Nobu uh, without bringing my family. And so uh, that's that's what's that's what's slowing. That's the the you know the the wheels of progress uh, move slowly. Uh, but uh, all right, let's. I mean, I know how you want to avoid page six. So I'm waiting fine. for another four years so I can triple this money. And uh, this is uh, I, I'm starting to look at this as my uh, as my uh, soon to be born child's uh, second child's <laughs> college uh, college fund actually. <laughs> so I hope you, you think uh, of another revenue stream. As well, well, I'm hoping for huge success, Ari, and uh, with pieces like this blockbuster piece in uh, the Nation magazine on. Uh, Entitled Conservatives Take Aim at Voting Rights. We have a link up uh, at uh, majority.fm. Um, this is, uh, y- you've been on the, the, the attack on, on voting rights by uh, conservatives. Uh, you've been on this beat for a couple of years now, and um, we've certainly seen its implications in many respects, particularly in uh, Congress in terms of uh, gerrymandering in such a way that is uh, borderline in some instances could arguably be violation of the Voting Rights Act in some respects, but um, uh, certainly it has, it has really perverted in, me- in many ways the, um, the electoral process. But, but before we go to that, let's talk specifically about the Voting Rights Act. Um, where what what was the impetus, obviously, for the Voting Rights Act, uh, and and specifically, um, uh, Section Five? Tell us, uh, just give us a little background on the Voting Rights Act. Sure. So I'll just give you a a brief history of American politics in thirty seconds. Uh, but we all know the Civil Take War ended in eighteen sixty. 1865, right, there was uh, a brief Reconstruction period when there were black senators, black congressmen, and black majorities in the South, which a lot of people uh, don't seem to realize. Federal troops were pulled out of the South uh, in 1877 as part of a compromise as a result of the disputed presidential election of 1876. Thus really began the Jim Crow period in the South uh, when you had uh, Southern state legislatures pass things like literacy tests, poll taxes, grandfather clauses, all-white primaries. And what you had is a situation where um, blacks went from being the majority in some states to essentially their being zero registered voters throughout the South among African Americans. And, and you had a situation up until the Voting Rights Act of 1965 uh, when an entire population was disenfranchised uh, in a very large region of the country. And so even though the 15th Amendment was passed in 1870 to prevent discrimination in voting, saying that you couldn't discriminate on basis of race, color, or condition of servitude uh, to be able to vote, the 15th Amendment really didn't become the enacted law of the land in any practical purpose until the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was so important because it fulfilled the promise of the 15th Amendment by guaranteeing the right to vote, uh, first for African Americans and then for other uh, minority groups uh, later on. And what it did is it not only abolished things like poll taxes and literacy tests, it not only mandated that uh, federal registrars would register people 
people to vote. So it registered millions of black Americans in the South and later Hispanic uh, and, and other uh, minority groups. But what it also did most critically, and this is Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, is Section 5 said to parts or all of 16 states with a history of racial discrimination in voting, that they had to clear their election changes with the federal government. So the onus was now on the states to prove that their voting changes were not discriminatory and not on the federal government to have to intervene to block those states after they were put into effect. So that change really wiped out a generation of voter suppression, and that is what is being challenged right now before the Supreme Court. How, you know, we, you know, We've talked about this in the past, and obviously we've talked about Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act on this program and, and, and with you in the past. How, how was that determination made? I mean, you know, uh, on, on its face it makes sense, but I mean, how do you know how they, they specifically came about to say these 16 counties um, have, a, uh, have, a, uh, have a history of disenfranchisement? Yeah. I mean, uh, what was so the they, mechanism? They knew originally the states that they wanted to cover. And then they reverse engineered the formula to be able to cover them. So they wanted to cover essentially the six main states of the Deep South and then go from there. And what they did is they based it on uh, two criteria. One was whether states, as of the 1964 election, uh, had voter registration rates for African Americans below 50 percent, and whether in that same election they had something like a poll tax or a literacy test on the books. And that was able to cover states like Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana and South Carolina uh, and Georgia and parts of North Carolina. Then it was expanded to bring in states that discriminated against language minority groups, so for example, Hispanic voters, and that brought in Texas. And then uh, other states over time were brought in places like Virginia, and then parts of other states were covered uh, as well. And what we find is the coverage formula of the act, which is being challenged right now, the states that are under Section 5 is being challenged, but it's fascinating to me that the same states that essentially discriminated against minority voters in 1964 are still the worst actors today. Nine full states, primarily in the South, are covered uh, by the Voting Rights Act, and two-thirds of those states passed some sort of new voting restriction since the 2010 election. So that's two-thirds of those states. If you look at the states that aren't covered by Section 5, which is basically two-thirds of the country, only a third of those states past new voting restrictions. So it certainly is true that there are states that aren't covered by Section 5, like Ohio and Pennsylvania, that are doing voter suppression. I don't think anyone's denying that. But the worst states are still those places like Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, South Carolina, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, so there's an argument in some respects that uh, rather than curtailing uh, Section 5, um, if... um it, we should actually be extending it. I mean, frankly, it seems to me that we should be. There's no there. There's there's no reason not to extend it to the to, to every state. I mean, for that matter, well, right? I don't, think, I don't think it's necessary to extend it to every state uh, for two reasons. Number one, I don't think every state has the same level of problems that you have in a place like Alabama. I also think uh, that it would be a tremendous amount of work for the right. Justice Department to have to review every single voting change that comes from places like Oregon that's not discriminating against voters. Actually, conservatives who don't like the Voting Rights Act have advocated that as a way to kill it. Uh, and, and people have said, well, some people love the Voting Rights Act so much they'd like to kill it. Um, but I do think that this is certainly on the heels of a presidential election, the last election in which voter suppression uh, was such a big deal. It seems particularly ironic to be discussing killing a key part of the Voting Rights Act right after an election that proved that voter suppression is still uh, alive and well, and not only alive and well, but is really expanding, not contracting. Let's uh, before we get into you know who's behind this uh, and, and, and and what uh, and sort of previewing this case in front of the Supreme Court. Let's if if you'll indulge me because uh, we've had this conversation I think in the past in terms of uh, the problems that we've seen uh, with voting and the use of redistricting to essentially disenfranchise uh, voters. The, the concept that there is no federal right to voting, I mean, I think in the past I've, I've said that's the case, but that's not really, I mean, this is, this is an arguable issue. Uh, now, we know that uh, Justice Scalia believes that there is no federal right uh, to vote. Uh, in your piece, uh, I think you, you, um, you've interviewed um, uh, Professor uh, Bagnan uh, Tsosis, uh, I can't pronounce it, uh, but um, 
the there are sort of like there are aspects in the Constitution which which at least suggest that there is a a federal right to vote. Uh, Article One, Section Four, gives Congress authority after the states have had their their um, their chance at it. Um, in terms of federal elections, it it allows for uh, Congress to have authority over the times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives. That would be Congress people, uh, and so there is at least some implication that the federal government that that there is a right to vote because uh, con- a federal right to vote, I should say, because Congress has some affirmative rights and responsibilities in ensuring or at least being able to exercise uh, some jurisdiction on how those votes are taken. Well, and my own feeling is that voting is mentioned a number of different times in the Constitution. So my feeling is that instead of trying to pass a new constitutional amendment that would guarantee the right to vote, which is an idea that Jesse Jackson Jr. had, which is certainly worthwhile, I think it makes more sense to enforce the existing statutes that are there. And with for the purposes of the Voting Rights Act, the 15th Amendment is very, very clear uh, that It says the right to vote, quote, shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So for the the purposes of the Voting Rights Act, there is a fundamental right to vote. And you can't deny that right to vote on the basis of race or color. Now, the problem was before the Voting Rights Act of 1965 took effect, there was no way to enforce it. And what the Voting Rights Act did is it was essentially an enforcement mechanism of the 15th Amendment. Interesting. And, and, and getting back, all right, so let's move back to, uh, to Section 5 here, because, you know, uh, we're not going to resolve that. And, of course, that's a, uh, a function of, I mean, that's going to be an interesting aspect, I would imagine, of the debate uh, that we're going to see in the Supreme Court uh, when they, they begin to hear this case uh, on the 27th of this. But um, one question, I just got this IM, and I, I hadn't even realized it, but there are... Um, Three counties, is that right, in New York State that are covered by the Voting Rights Act? Um, uh, Bronx, uh, Kings County, and New York County. I, I presume that it was the same measure for those counties, is that right? Those counties were covered because they discriminated against language minority groups. That they they discriminated against. Uh, I believe it was first uh, Hispanic voters and then uh, Asian American voters. And uh, there are counties that are covered because they had English only information uh, for language minority groups at the polls, which is uh, prohibited under the Voting Rights Act. So that's why portions of New York are covered. I would uh, imagine the same the- for Florida and California as well. Yeah, if you look at the the states though. Um, that are principally covered by the act, the the nine states that are fully subject to the act, which is Alaska, Alabama, Arizona, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, South Carolina, Texas, and Virginia. I mean, seven of those nine states are in the South. So really, the, the Voting Rights Act has its biggest impact in the South. That's mm-hmm. where voter suppression laws are uh, still concentrated. And that's, interestingly enough, the region of the country where demographic change, in, in many respects, is the most rapid. And right. so even though opposition to Section 5 has been around in the South ever since it passed, uh, there is an intensification of efforts to get rid of Section 5 because uh, conservatives want to put in new voting restrictions in places like North Carolina and South Carolina and Georgia to try to stem the tide of, of rapid demographic change. And that that really is at the heart of what's going on here, because that is why we're seeing such uh, intense efforts to to uh, to overturn uh, the Section 5. And I mean, I, I imagine there's also an amazing story, uh, or at least um, a significant story in terms of, uh, of what was taking place uh, in the the Senate and the House in terms of negotiating and getting this law passed in terms of the implications of which states were on it and which weren't. Yeah, there were. I mean, this all happened very, very quickly, you have to remember. Uh, there were the bloody Sunday demonstrations in Selma in March of 1965, in, in which people like Congressman John Lewis, who was at that time a young civil rights act, activist, uh, were brutally beaten uh, by demonstrating for voting rights. Uh, eight months later, LBJ, well, eight days later, LBJ 
introduced the Voting Rights Act, and it was signed by Congress in August of that year. And so uh, there, there really weren't concrete plans to push a Voting Rights Act per se uh, until the Bloody Sunday March, and that, that really accelerated the timetable. And so Congress, even though there was a significant uh, n- numbers of Southern representatives in Congress who opposed this thing, it did pass overwhelmingly. And it's important to remember that there's been four reauthorizations of the Voting Rights Act subsequently. All have been signed by Republican presidents. The last reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act in 2006 was passed overwhelmingly by a Republican House in 2006 and signed by George W. Bush. And so what's really remarkable is how seven years after that reauthorization, the fact that there was this bipartisan consensus that supported the Voting Rights Act as recently as 2006 has now collapsed. And you essentially have a Republican Party that was once proud of signing the Voting Rights Act, leading the charge uh, to try to overturn it. And that's not every Republican. You still have people, for example, like Representative James Sensenbrenner, who was the chair of the Judiciary Committee at the time, who supports the Voting Rights Act. But certainly the momentum within the Republican caucus is moving towards opposing, not supporting the Voting Rights Act. And, and, And because it was reauthorized for 25 years, the only um, mechanism for conservatives at this point to attack it is through the uh, the Supreme Court. So who is uh, who is bringing this case? Um, who are the plaintiffs here uh, in this case? So the plaintiffs are from Alabama, which again is interesting because. Alabama, more than any other state, is responsible for the pa- passage of the Voting uh, Rights Act. I'm going to have it, to do this. It seems uh, just too perfectly apropos. Surprise, surprise. Good. <laughs> I don't remember. So, so the, the, uh, the, that really caught me off guard. So the challenge originates in Shelby County, Alabama, which is an exurb of Birmingham, which as many people know, was once regarded as the most segregated city in the country. Uh, within Shelby County is a very uh, white, wealthy Republican county. Within Shelby County, there is a town called Calera. Calera was a, a pretty small town, about 3,000 people in 2000. Uh, a lot of people moved there from Birmingham uh, after 2000, so they did a redistricting in 2008 for local elections. Uh, there was one black member of the city council uh, in Calera. He represented a district that was 71% African American. After the redistricting, his district was moved from 71% African American to 30% African American by adding all these white subdivisions to his district. Uh, the Justice Department opposed the, the, that change. They said that the city could have drawn a uh, majority minority district and chose not to. Uh, so what happened was the Justice Department objected to this change a day before the election in Calera. Calera held the election anyway, and this black city councilman lost. There was new elections in 2009 as a result of negotiations with the Justice Department. Uh, this black city council member won his seat. That seemed to be the end of it. But what happened is Shelby County uh, decided to file suit challenging the constitutionality of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. And we can talk about this, but the, the challenge itself uh, was spurred on by a conservative legal defense fund in Washington. Well, that's the point, too, right? I mean, uh, this uh, the Calera and the Shelby County probably didn't have the money or necessarily the uh, the intense will to do this, but for... A, uh, a conservative legal fund that wants to challenge the the Voting Rights Act. I mean, do we have a sense before we go into who that fund is? Or well, let, let's talk about who who is that fund? Who's who is funding that fund? Sure. So it's a one man show called the Project on Fair Representation, uh, run by a guy named Ed Blum. Ed Blum was a former stockbroker who ran for Congress in 1992 in Houston in a majority black district. He lost that district, uh, but it convinced him that the VRA had turned into a nefarious force for racial gerrymandering. So he started uh, this uh, conservative legal defense fund called the Project on Fair Representation. It was initially housed at the American Enterprise Institute. He funded it to try to oppose uh, the reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act when it was reauthorized by Congress in 2006, he then started finding court challenges. And so he would find plaintiffs who would challenge not only the Voting Rights Act, but other race-based protections like affirmative action. He's also funding the affirmative action case before the Supreme Court that's been argued and will be decided uh, this summer. And This is a banner year for that guy. 
It, it, I mean, it really is. And, and one of the reasons that he's been able to be so successful is he's funded exclusively by this consortium called the Donors Trust, which I, I don't think most people know about. Um, but it's a consortium of right-wing funders. And they get a lot of money from people, for example, like Charles Koch. And then Donors Trust gives out money. So they gave out $22 million in 2010 to a whole who's who of conservative groups, including the American Legislative Exchange Council, Grover Norquist, et cetera, et cetera. This group is funding Blum so that he's received $1.2 million from Donors Trust uh, in the last five years. And that's allowed him to find these plaintiffs and then hook them up with very influential uh, Washington lawyers. So he's been the catalyst to get these cases like affirmative action uh, and the Voting Rights Act before the Supreme Court. How much plaintiff shopping did this guy do? In other words, uh, were there other attempts, were there other cases that did not, uh, that, that, um, that he pursued? Did he have other plaintiffs? How was it, uh, were they, I, I imagine that he was looking around for these cases. He, he found some other ones, but maybe they just didn't go as far. Um, the, what, what's the, the history of, of his, uh, attempts to find the, the perfect plaintiff that would be amenable to this, uh, amenable, I should say, to this, uh, Supreme Court. So eight days after Bush signed the reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act in 2006, there was a Blum-sponsored case from Texas that was filed challenging the constitutionality of Section 5. Uh, it was heard 100 days uh, after uh, Obama's inauguration. And what the court did in that case is they, they said that this small local utility that was challenging the law, that they could, quote-unquote, bail out of the Voting Rights Act and from Section 5. So... Uh, Places with a clean record can get out of Section 5, which I think is important to note. And the Supreme Court said that uh, this utility from Texas could get out. Um, but the court also said, John Roberts, writing for the majority, said uh, that he had serious constitutional questions about the Voting Rights Act. And that basically ensured that there would be another challenge. And at that point, when Blum uh, had lost before the Supreme Court in 2009, although been given a green light for future challenges, he went out and... and found the Shelby County case uh, and really put that on a fast track before the Supreme Court. So we're in this weird situation where in 2009, the Supreme Court heard a challenge to Section 5, and now just four years later, they're going to hear another challenge. And this is, uh, you know, this is a really important dynamic for people, I think, to understand in terms of the way that uh, the Supreme Court works. We, we see this time and time again um, in terms of the law changing in both directions, frankly, um, um, regressively and progressively, that the Supreme Court will take sort of um, tangential or ancillary cases that uh, begin to chip away and, cr and basically set up um, uh, the, and create sort of a, a body of, of decisions that will set up for a case like this. So, I mean, we can look to the, um, the Affordable Care Act, uh, uh, ruling and say the, the court has set up certain, uh, potential, uh, potentiality in the future to, to find, uh, to change the law of the land in some respects because it has chipped away at the Commerce Clause. In this instance, we saw the Supreme Court uh, use this first case as a way of perhaps basically setting up this one. And I think, I, I, you know, uh, and I don't know if you've done any reporting in this regard, but I think it's, it's naive to presume that there isn't indications uh, both in the opinions that the Supreme Court justices write and through sort of their associations as to uh, what kind of case the Supreme Court is interested in hearing. Well, and, and, and John Roberts has made it very clear that he wanted to challenge Section 5. John Roberts made his name as a young lawyer in the Reagan Justice Department by opposing the expansion of the Voting Rights Act. It was a different provision of the Voting Rights Act, but Roberts has a long history of activism against the Voting Rights Act. Uh, and it's important to remember just how radical a decision would be uh, striking this law down. I mean, this is, this is something, uh, Section 5, that's been upheld in four different Supreme Court challenges. This is considered the most important civil rights law passed by the Congress, one of the most important pieces of legislation passed ever by the Congress. And this was something that was reauthorized overwhelmingly in 2006. And so what the court is going to say here, if they strike down Section 5, they're basically going to say to Congress, you didn't have the authority to overwhelmingly reauthorize this law. 
And that's a very, very slippery slope. That's a dis- that decision would have ramifications well beyond the Voting Rights Act and imperil all other pieces of legislation uh, that Congress passed to try to remedy discrimination in one form or another. It also, it also, I mean, just in terms of like broader, um, uh, you know, uh, judicial philosophy, this is this is one of those classic cases that conservatives supposedly always have a problem with, right? Which is, which is overturning um, duly passed legislation by uh, by Congress. I mean, this is what they consider to be judicial activism. Is is well, essentially I, yeah, exactly. I mean, I think it would be a very very rough decision. It would go against a long line uh, of precedent. Uh, It would invalidate a historic piece of legislation. And there's already a mechanism for people who have clean records to get out from Section 5 can bail out from the act. And and since this 2009 court case that I referred to uh, earlier in the piece that the Supreme Court heard, uh, states and counties are increasingly bailing out of the act in record numbers. And so basically uh, what states are saying is that uh, they want to be able to keep discriminating, <laughs> because uh, if they stop discriminating, they could get out from the act. Those so they essentially want a green light to keep discriminating against minority voters. So, wait, so the so uh, when when states and counties bail out of the act, they, do they do so with Department of Justice approval? Is that is that essentially the mechanism? Yes. yes. And and more jurisdictions have bailed out uh, in the last three years than that had bailed out in the previous twenty seven years. And what is uh, the and, criteria and no for doing that? That has tried to bail out has been turned down. So. States can bail out of this, but you have to have a clean record to be able to bail out. And, and, and so what is, the, what is the principle upon which the, 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 the plaintiff is arguing? And, and, and again, we should say here that the plaintiffs aren't arguing that they should not be subjected to um, the, the Section 5. Uh, they're not saying our statistics show that we uh, should not, that, that Section 5 should not be applied to us. They are arguing that Section 5 is unconstitutional. Is that right? And, yeah. And, and so what is, uh, yes. uh, based upon what principle? So they are, they are saying that the Section 5 was meant to be a temporary provision based on an emergency situation in the South, and that that quote-unquote emergency is over, and that things have changed in the South sufficiently that the South should no longer be targeted. Uh, And it's unconstitutional for Alabama to be treated differently than Michigan. Now, the problem with that argument is that there are statistics upon statistics, one of which I just mentioned earlier, that Alabama is much worse than Michigan, uh, that there are more likely to be challenges, not only under Section 5, but obviously under other provisions of the Voting Rights Act, for example, Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, that 81% of successful Voting Rights Act lawsuits occur in places covered by Section 5. So clearly, discrimination is still concentrated in those states. Uh, And the fact that there is voter suppression going on in Michigan uh, would seem an odd reason to say to Alabama, well, now... uh, you get you get a green light uh, to do to do this, the same kind of stuff. I mean, part of the reason why a, a finding a decision that that somehow the section five is unconstitutional on those grounds is that if you're arguing that it was temporary, that it was meant to be temporary, um, then you're also arguing implicitly that it was constitutional to deal with a an existing situation. If you cannot prove that that existing situation has gone away, there's no reason to argue that the Section 5 is now unconstitutional for some reason. If you are arguing that it was meant to be temporary, there seems to be to be ample evidence that it was temporary for those states that have been able to opt out once they have uh, proven that they have sufficiently corrected the problem that made Section 5 constitutional when it was implemented. Uh, there, there's going to have to be a lot of uh, sort of uh, pretzel twisting for, 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 for the, the, the Supreme Court to, to find this act sort of... Yeah, on its face, unconstitutional. Well, the question is, is this going to be an empirical judgment or is this going to be an ideological judgment? You, well, you have then I already know the how it's, they're going to rule. Yeah, but, but what I'm going to say is if you have justices on the court uh, that have a long history of being skeptical of remedies uh, to racial discrimination, John Roberts certainly falls in that camp. Anthony Kennedy is more 
of a swing vote. He is someone who has praised Section 5 as recently as 2009, uh, but has also worried uh, that it doesn't make sense to treat, as I mentioned earlier, Alabama different than Michigan. And even though uh, in 2009 the evidence was presented before Kennedy uh, that states like Alabama were much worse in terms of discrimination than states like Michigan, he really was obsessed with this point. And I don't know if the evidence of the 2012 election, the thing I mentioned earlier, uh, that two-thirds uh, of the states that are fully covered by Section 5 pass new voting restrictions, but only one-third of the states that aren't covered by Section 5. So I don't know if that's going to sway the justice, uh, but I think there's a differentiation between Kennedy and Roberts on this. I think Roberts is more openly hostile. There's definitely four votes to overturn it. Uh, and, and the question, as it is with all of these cases, it, is what will Kennedy end up doing? Will he take a very radical position like he took in Obamacare, or will he take a, a more progressive, restrained position uh, like he has done uh, in earlier cases that have upheld a remedies to racial discrimination? There, there are people in the Federalist Society right now having a heart attack uh, with the uh, sort of the juxtaposition of progressive, restrained decision, uh, as, as you refer to it. But uh, in the course of your reporting, do you have a sense of how the, uh, the Obama administration, the Justice Department, is contemplating what they would do in the event that Section 5 is struck down? Because it seems to me at that point, if it is struck down on the grounds that it's unfair to treat Alabama differently from Michigan, then the there is, at the very least, uh, and I don't know whether or not it could pass, but an argument that, okay, we're going to have to do this. We're going to have to add uh, attorneys at the Justice Department, and we're going to have to uh, su suggest legislation that says everyone is subjected to a preclearance, um, uh, you know, prior to any, any let's say, uh, they create a, a new uh, floor for, for, or a, uh, a threshold. Uh, what, uh, what type of decisions might change the, uh, the the have genuine impact on 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 the electoral process is is well, the, the, pro the the problem is that anything any change is going to have to pass Congress and I don't expect House Republicans uh, given the current makeup of the Congress. Uh, to pass any sort of new fix to the Voting Rights Act. I so, would agree uh, to that. I would agree with that, too. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you don't uh, start to uh, create this legislation and contemplate it. I mean, surely... No, you, cre you create it, but in the interim, the Justice Department would be really hamstrung because the Justice Department is acting based on congressional authority. And so any kind of new legislation would have to pass Congress. So, you know, if, if the court doesn't uphold the act and they don't fully strike it down, but they instead say to Congress... You need to, quote, unquote, fix this, which I think is a, a fairly likely outcome. That's as good as killing it for now, because this Congress is not going to pass a new extension of the Voting Rights Act, and it's certainly not going to pass an extension that puts more states as part of this. That's just not going to happen. Wow. Uh, this is going to be uh, an incredible... So do you, give me a sense of just um, the, 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 the case begins on the 27th. What... Uh, what happens at that point? I mean, we we have a couple of days of uh, oral arguments, and then no, we find it's 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 one day, and it's about an hour. I mean, people forget that Supreme Court cases are very very short, uh, and the the oral arguments don't last very long. There's been a plethora of briefs followed, uh, filed on both sides. So there's a huge uh, volume of briefs before the court. I don't know how many of those uh, they will read, um, but the case will be heard on February 27th, and then it's likely that there will be a decision uh, in June. It's shaping up to be a very, very consequential Supreme Court term. We're going to have decisions on the Voting Rights Act, on affirmative action, and also Prop 8 and the Defense of Marriage Act. So it's, it's one of the most important Supreme Court terms, I think, certainly in my lifetime and, and perhaps in the last 50 or 100 years. Uh, and, and, and is there a commensurate sort of... Uh outside political sort of response to this? In other words, you know, uh, one of the things that uh, there was some speculation that influenced uh, John Roberts' decision in the Affordable Care Act was the amount of attention it was getting. Um, yeah. And it seems to me that I haven't heard anyone, uh, short of yourself, um, you know, maybe I've seen some small uh, pieces, but I haven't heard of any political organizing around this at all. I mean, because the, 
you know, uh, presumably if if there was to be if there had to be some type of if they threw it back to Congress and said, you have to remedy this, that, of course, makes it explicitly political. Uh, But um, one would imagine that you'd want some sense that, hey, look, the country's watching, you know, and paying attention yeah. to it. Uh, I think there needs to be more pressure uh, put on the court. I think that more people um, need to talk about it. I think more people need to talk about uh, the level of radicalism uh, that there would be. There's been a, a number of congressional briefs filed um, by people like Harry Reid, but also by people, Republicans, uh, like James Sensenbrenner in the House. And I think those people um, need to speak up more talk about what the ramifications would be. And I also think that people need to start thinking, well, what happens? What do we do if they strike this down? Or what do we do if they say fix this? Is there some sort of plan that you can put out there and start pushing so that people aren't just caught like they were after the Citizens United decision with no answer and still have no strategy for overturning it? So hopefully the Voting Rights Act and the voting rights community uh, is further along in terms of uh, their activism than the uh, campaign finance community was. And, I mean, you just have to look at what happened very recently. I mean, in Virginia, we had a situation, right. as I'm sure you've talked about on this show, uh, where on Martin Luther King Day, uh, when an 81-year-old civil rights activist was out of town, the Virginia Senate Republicans passed a redistricting plan. It's 2020 uh, in the Virginia would, Senate, and uh, he was out of town, so it was 1920. Is a uh, literal. Yeah, and and they they passed a redistricting plan that would have uh, hurt black voting strength in in eight to twelve districts, and this is a state that's subject to Section Five, and this just happened three weeks ago. Now, so my I mean, understanding if, if is they backed off that, ago, right? They've, they've, uh... The House backed off it. The House backed off it. Uh, but it's hard to argue that things have changed in the South uh, when Virginia Republicans would do something like this on Martin Luther King Day when, of all people, a civil rights lawyer was out of town. I mean, I think that's, that's kind of the best evidence you need uh, that places like Virginia still need to be covered under Section 5. I can't see uh, Antman and Scalia being terribly sympathetic to that, but who who on the left is sort of the, um, who, to the extent that there is anybody who is um, uh, paying attention to this and the possible implications of uh, of a decision that uh, you know where that the voting rights act, that section five is inoperable until it's fixed or we're going to overturn it or something like what organization through your reporting is the, um, seems to be the sort of the, 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 the beachhead, uh, or that is doing the most work and in, in trying to plan for that potential outcome. Well, I think first in terms of just the legal challenge, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund has really been organizing the response uh, to the case. And so they've been uh, the ones that have been uh, providing, uh, I think, the most informative briefs and that have been pulling together all the different communities uh, to say why the Voting Rights Act is important, from uh, conservative Republicans like James Sensenbrenner uh, to traditional uh, civil rights groups. You had, during the 2006 uh, reauthorization, you had a very large coalition of people uh, under the rubric of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights that was defending uh, this bill. I think you'll see that coalition uh, come together. Again, I think as we get closer to the decision, uh, you'll hear uh, more people uh, speaking out about the law, I, I kind of wanted my article to come out around now so people would have a few weeks to digest it so they would actually know what was happening with this challenge uh, before the Supreme Court hears it. Yeah, it's important. In fact, um, I think we'll try and have somebody come on from that um, from the uh, NAACP to uh, discuss it. Um, I think I went to college with one of their lead litigators. So yeah. uh, thank you for that, Ari. And, uh, well, Ari, uh, fascinating piece. It's something, obviously, that's hugely important, not getting enough um, uh, attention. And uh, I think it was uh, uh, rather thoughtful of you to do it at this time, as opposed to when, on February 27th, when everybody else will write this piece. 